Today we're going to look at Little Man Computer. First of all, you need to go to peterhigginson.co.uk slash lmc. That will open up a web page which will have an assembly code emulator. When you have the page open, we need to start writing our first program. Now the first one we're going to do is we're going to ask for three numbers and print them in reverse order. So if you enter number one, number two, number three, you're going to print out number three, then number two, then number one. We have preset commands that we can use. The first command we're going to use is INP for input. This gets something from the keyboard. When we have a number from the keyboard, we could do a storing it somewhere. So we're going to store it, and I'm just going to call mine num1. Now at the end of our program, we need to say that num1 is a variable. And we do that by using num one dat. That just reserves a place in memory for our variable to be kept. Now we've got one number in and we've stored it. Now we need three numbers in total, so let's get another number and store this one and another number up from the keyboard as well. Now remember we do need to say that we are having these variables. Now as I am just taking in three numbers and print them out in reverse order, I've decided I'm not going to bother to store the third one. I could, but to make my program as efficient as possible, I'm not actually going to store it because I don't need to use the third one. When I've got the third one from the keyboard, I can just send this straight out, straight away. So it's going to take in a number and store it as num1, take a number and store it as num2, take a number, but rather than store it, I'm just going to output it, because that's the third number, and that's the first one that I want to output. Now the next one I want to output is I want to output num2. So I need to load that one into memory so I can output it. So load it up and output num2. So I've output number three, then output number two. So obviously the last one is I need to load up num1 and output that one as well. Now I'm pr predicting my program work, but let's test it. I click on submit, and it takes all of the code I wrote, rearranges it a little bit, but then turns it into a program. This program is also then stored into RAM, and you can see that my commands have just been translated across. An input command is actually known as 901, and that's in position one. I then go to store 10, and that's the store command is command 3, and it's storing it in memory position 10, which is this dat here. If you look, I've got 3, 10. My commands are just being converted across. When I click on run, it'll start the program. If I want to speed up a little bit, I can click on these little arrows here to make it run a little bit faster. My program has run around to the point where it's asked for the first input. I, my first number, I will just put in the number 1. It carries on, now asks me for a second one. So this time, I'll put in number two. And now it's asking me my third number, well, I'll use the number three. So I'm hoping my program will continue and output three, two, one. Which it does. I did miss one little thing out which would have been nice on my program. It would have been nice to actually have a halt command. Halt means stop the program. It would be nice to stop the program so it doesn't try and run the whatever's in memory at the end for these variables. So it is just a little bit neater to have a halt command at the end. And that's our first little program done, where it takes in three numbers and prints them out in reverse order. For our second problem, we're going to take in three numbers, but add them up together this time. I'm actually going to modify my existing program, because we take in a number and store it, take in a number and store it, take in a number. That's a very good starting point. So I'll get rid of the bit out of the middle. We still need our two dats for num1 and num2. And yes, I am going to output the answer and halt at the end. But this time, I take a number and store it, take a number and store it, take in my third number. Now, the computer is still remembering my third number at the moment. So if I was to add on my second number, it's now going to be remembering the total of the third and second numbers. Then if I was to also add on the first number, it's now remembering the sum of the third and the second and the first. It's added all three together. Now, again, I could store the answer if I wanted to, but for today we're just going to output and then halt the program. So my program now should input a number and store it, input a number and store it, input my third number, but not bother storing it, just keep it in memory. It'll add on one of the stored numbers, and the totals in memory, then it adds on 
the first number and the totals in memory. And that final total is what we want to output, and we halt the program. Again, we'll try and run it and see what happens. So I will do the number uh, 3, the number 6, which will make 9, and the number 1 to make a total of 10. So let's hope it gives me 10. Yes, it does. The output is 10. So that second program has worked. For our next program, we're going to take in two numbers and print out the first minus the second. And then we're going to print out the second minus the first. We're going to do two calculations. Now, as we've got two numbers, again, we are going to need to have num1 and num2 as variables. And yes, we're going to need to get those from the keyboard. So input stores num1, input stores 2. We might as well keep that because that's how program's going to start. We need to take in two numbers. And the first thing we need to do is we need to do the first number, take away the second number. Now in memory, I've actually still got this second number. We input it and stored it. And that's what's in the computer's memory. So if I want to do num1, take num2, I need to load num1 into memory and then I can subtract num2. And now the answer is in memory, and I just need to output that. So I've output num1 minus num2. The second part of this program was to output n2 minus n1. Well, I can load n2 into memory, and then I can subtract n1, and then the answer is in memory. And yes, it would be nice if I was to output that as well. And just for neatness, we could do with halting the program. So our program now should take in two numbers. It will load number one and take away number two and output the answer. Then load number two, subtract number one, output the answer, and then halt. So submit our program. It all compiles nicely. We click on run. And what I will do is I will do three as my first number and 5 is my second number. So it should do 3 take away 5, which is minus 2, and then 5 take away 3, which is positive 2. And that's the answer it gives us. So, so far, so good. For our fourth program, we're going to ask for two numbers. If the numbers are the same, we're going to double it. So if they put in 5 and 5, we'll output 10. But if they give us different numbers, 3 and 5, then we're going to just output 3 and output 5. So we can do two different things depending on what our numbers are. So we need to do some branching, basically like if statements. Again, we're still going to need two numbers taken in and we're going to need two numbers stored. So I'm still going to use input store num1, input store num2, and I'm using num1 dot num2 dot. I'm still going to have two variables that I'm using. Now I need to see if these two numbers are the same. Now the easiest way to see if two numbers are the same is we can do one number, take away the other number. If the answer is zero, they're obviously the same. Now it doesn't matter if I do n1 take away n2 or n2 take away n1, because we're only interested if they're actually the same number. At this stage in my program, num2 is actually still in memory. We input the number and it's still in memory here. So rather than loading n1 and subtracting n2, slightly more efficient, as n2 is in memory, I could just subtract n1. Let's just take the first number off. Now, if they are 0, the answer is 0, if they're the same, I can do a branch of 0 to a place. And I'm going to call it same. And this program is going to jump right the way down to here, where I've got the word same. And the task I had to do if they were the same was basically double the number. So at the moment in memory is 0, because I've done one take away the other. That's what the computer's memory. So let's load up I don't know, num1. Now, if we're doubling it, it's actually quite easy because they're both the same. I can actually add on, as they're both the same, I can add on a num1 or num2. It doesn't really matter because we've already decided they're both the same. So once I've loaded the number and added on the number, I'll have double the value, which is what I wanted, so I can output it, and yes, I can hold my program. Now that's fine if the computer program has taken this branch. Now, if it hasn't taken a branch because the numbers are not the same, then it's just going to carry on with the program. Now, what I wanted the program to do was to output, just output the two numbers. So, if they're not the same, I just need to load up one of the numbers. Num1 will do fine. And I need to output it. I can then load up the other number. 
and I can output that one as well. And that will output my two numbers. And it would be nice also to put a halt, because if I don't put a halt here, once it has output the two numbers, it will carry on and it will actually load number one, add number two, and output that answer as well, which isn't quite what we want. But if I put a halt, it means the program will stop after it's output the two numbers, which is exactly what we want. So let's click on Submit to compile a program. Click on Run. And let's try it. First of all, we'll try it with two numbers that are the same. So we'll try it with number 5 and then number 5. And that should branch and output 10, which it does. Now what we're going to do is we're going to reset the program. We're going to run it again. This time I'm going to put in two different numbers. So I'll put in 3 and 5. Now it should just output those two numbers, which it does. It outputs 3 and it outputs 5, which is exactly what we wanted for this program as well. For this next program, we're going to ask for two numbers and print out the biggest number and then the smallest number. So once again, we might as well keep the basics to start with. We need to have two numbers taken in and storing them as variables. Now what we need to do is we need to find out which one is bigger than the other one. So we need to do one take away the other. And if the result's negative, we know that which one was bigger. If the result's positive, we know that the other one was bigger. Now, sometimes it might be nice to actually write down a couple of examples so that you know which way around it is. I have currently got number 2 in memory, because we did input and then store num2. Number 2 is in memory. So again, I'm going to just subtract num1. Now, I could have done load num1 sub n2, but that's an extra command. So I'm just, again, trying to be as efficient as I can. So as n2 is in memory, I will subtract n1. If the result is positive, that means that the second number must have been larger. Because if the second number was 5 and the first number was 3, 5 take away 3 gives you a positive answer of 2. So branch to if positive, I will branch to a place called largest second. Because that's a good name for if the second number is largest. Now we need to have that piece of code somewhere down here, so let's call it largest second again. And what I'm going to do is I want to print out the biggest and the smallest. So if the second one is largest, let's load up the second one. And what we're going to do is we're going to output it, and then we want to output the smaller number, so that would obviously in this case be num1. So we need to load that one and output that one. And again, just to need to have a program, we need to halt. Now if it didn't branch, that means that the largest number must have been the first number. So what we'll do is we'll load up the first number, and then output it, and then we'll load up the second number, and output it. Again, we need a halt command. If we don't have a halt command, what will happen is it will load num1 output, load number 2 output, and then load number 2 output, load number 1 output. It will end up with giving us far too much information, and it won't do what we want it to do. Now we need to check that this works. So we submit the code, so it compiles it, we run the code, and we're going to choose two numbers. So I'm going to put a small number in of 3 and a large number of 55, and we want it to output the larger number than the smaller number, which it does. So let's try this again. So let's reset the code and run it again. Last time I did 3, then 55. So tell you what, we'll do it the other way around. Let's do 55, and then we'll do 3. It should still output the largest and the smallest, which it does. So again, our program has done what we wanted it to do. This is where things get a little bit more difficult. What we're going to do is we're going to take in two numbers and multiply them. Now to be able to multiply them, what we're going to do is we're going to actually add a number on a certain number of times. So if it is 3 times 4, we can either add 3 on 4 times, or 4 on 3 times. It doesn't really matter which way around, but we need to use one of the numbers as like a loop counter. And we need to use the other number to add on. This is a little bit tricky, but we'll give it a go. So we'll start off by taking in two numbers and storing them, because we need to. 
Now for this we're also going to need some extra variables. We are going to need like an answer variable, which is going to keep a running total, and I can actually give that to start with a default value of zero. We also need to have a variable so that we can take off one. So I'm actually going to have a variable called one, and that's going to store the value of one. So we've got our two values in from the keyboard. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up my answer. And my answer at the moment is zero. I'm going to add on num1. And then I'm going to store my answer. So what I've done is I've actually loaded my answer, which is zero, added on my number for the first time, and stored that nice and safely back in answer. Now I also, if I've added on, if I'm adding on four three times, I've added on four once, I need to make my three deducted one. I need to get, make that loop counter go down by one. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the other number as a loop counter. So I'm going to load number two, which is going to be my loop counter. I'm going to subtract one, which is the value of one from it. And then I'm going to store that back again as my loop counter. Now I need to loop back around to the top. Now what I could do, I could do this a few ways, but I'm going to branch always to a little label called loop. And I'll put that at the top here called loop. So what I need to do really is I need to say, right, how many have I got in my loop counter? Now at this point in my program, STA2 is my loop counter. To start with, it's got a value. When I loop around, I've subtracted one from it. So I need to see actually, how many does it have in there? Because if it's got zero in it, I actually want to jump right to the end of my program. And the very end of my program can be down here. I just want to load up the answer, which I called ants, and I could do without putting it. Because that should hopefully be my totaled up answer. Now obviously I need a halt. So we've got two branches. We've got one to branch to jump out of the loop, just to the end, when I've my loop counter has gone down to zero. And I've got another one that kind of loops back to the beginning to make it loop round and round and round until we get to that certain point. Let's see if this works. So I've compiled it and it's all accepted. I'll try running the program. And let's think about what values we're going to add. Let's just add 5 and let's times it by 4. And hopefully we'll get the answer 20. It has a little think and it comes up with the answer 20 that was correct. So it in our case, the second number, 4, was the loop counter, so it added on 5 four times. And we came up with a multiplication. And I think that'll do for today.